So uh, it's uh, my name is Mike Stratmanis. Uh, I am uh, the chief engagement officer at the Obama Foundation, uh, and I'm I'm here really just to tell a, a story about Chicago through the people that I know and I admire. Um, there's so many headlines about uh, about the city that I love, and uh, and I and I think the Chicago is really a place that has um, all of the challenges that you'd want to find um, and that you hear about and that you read about. Uh, they're all present in Chicago, but it also has all the solutions that you'd want to find, um, and the solutions are in its people um, who are working every day, uh, leaders who are uh, on the ground. Um, building their communities, bringing people together to solve problems um, and to make positive change. And, uh, and I have one of those leaders that's with me here uh, today, and that's, uh, that's Joseph Williams. Uh, Joseph, uh, you're going to, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you, and I think people are going to love to hear about what you're doing. Um, uh, you know, you are a, a father, you uh, run a nonprofit. Uh, you're, you are engaged in something uh, that is called a violence interrupter. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, but before we get into all of that, um, Joseph, tell me a, a little bit about this, you know, where you're from. You know, in Chicago, every time you meet somebody, you ask them what high school they went to. Because once you know what high school they went to, you know what neighborhood they grew up in, and you know a little bit about their story. So you don't have to tell me what high school you went to. If you want to, go on ahead. Yeah, but uh, yeah. but talk to me a little bit about yourself uh, and where where you're from, where you grew up. Okay, no, no, absolutely, and and thank you guys for having me today. Uh, so yeah, my name is uh, Joseph Williams, uh, husband, father to five beautiful children, uh, born and raised on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I went to King College Prep High School uh, right there. Uh, back in the day, they called it the Low End. Uh, it's now considered the Bronzeville area. And, um, <laughs> right, they call it Bronzeville now. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, for the most part, um, my mom, I uh, have a mom, uh, she raised me and my younger brother, so uh, we didn't have the opportunity to have both parents in the home, but uh, we still were able to make it out of that and continue to do some of the good work that we're doing right now. Uh, I think growing up in that particular environment, it, it pushed me uh, to be who I am today. But uh, beyond that, um, I just love being supportive of people and organizations and trying to make a difference in my community, really. So um, that's just a little bit about me. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And what neighborhood do you live in now? Uh, now, Inglewood. So I'm Inglewood. Now in Inglewood with my family. And I'll tell you, we love it over in Inglewood. It is beautiful. Um, it's a lot of good things happening in Inglewood. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that always uh, I hear from people who um, I tell to come to the South Side, people who come either to the office or people who I take on um, a little trip around to see where the Obama Presidential Center is coming. I think people just are always surprised at just how green it is. Um, you know, the lawns, the parks. Um, it's just a, a beautiful place to grow up. It's a, and it's a beautiful place to raise a family. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, you talked about it was being your mother and, and not having your father in the home. And, and, you know, I know we share a little bit about that. You know, my father left our family uh, before I was born. Uh, my mother remarried and, uh, you know, he adopted me, brought me into uh, his home. They ended up getting divorced and split up. And so, you know, I really wanted to um, break that cycle. I really wanted to, I'm very proud of the fact that um, you know, my kids, my wife, we're together, uh, I'm present, I'm with them, with them in their lives, you know, we've kind of ended that cycle uh, around uh, absent fathers. And, and I know people don't always see um, the stories of black men being the active fathers uh, that you are. And I know you've broken that cycle too, right? No, yeah, uh, absolutely. So exact same situation almost, right? Um, and, and I just wanted to be different. So as I started to have my children, I knew I wanted to be in my children's life because I knew how important it was. Um, and how I didn't have the opportunity to really have that. So I, I just realized, like, it, it's extremely important to really have both parents, if possible, but definitely to have that man model in a children's life, how they could really make an impact. So that was my, and, and, and honestly, that's why I started my nonprofit, um, the Mr. Dad's Father's Club. The reason to start my nonprofit was, to really just get men back actively involved in their children's lives, but also other children as well, because all children aren't always 
fortunate enough to have their father there, right? So we wanted to step up and, and step into that role and make sure that we're there to mentor the children and read books to them. So um, the ultimate goal, again, was to just try to bring that male model and, and, and understand that how huge of a difference it makes um, involving our kids and giving them the guidance they need as they grow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 you know, every time I'm in a, you know, the public school or I'm in an elementary school in particular, you know, it's interesting. You actually don't see uh, a lot of men uh, in there. And, and so when I'm in there, you know, I, I often find that a lot of kids come kind of gravitate um, to me, even if I'm there, you know, for my own child or I'm there for some kind of an event. Um, have you, you know, have you seen the same thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, for real. Um, so uh, even when first starting my nonprofit, I was just your know, ordinary dad coming into the school volunteering. So I was just volunteering, doing lunchroom duty, and I grab a book and read to a classroom. And for me, reading books to the classroom, the kids loved it so much. It started to just be an ongoing thing every week where I just pick days out of the week now to come and read books to the children. Then other fathers, I might see them come and drop their kids off or they would come and see me in a classroom reading, then they wanted to start reading books. So it just really just helped really just get a lot of good men involved. And now over at, at Beasley Academic Center, uh, you're looking at at least 20 plus dads on a weekly wow. basis that come in just to read books to children and, and mentor the children. So it does make a huge difference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that to me, and I, you know, I'll just tell you, Joseph, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you because, you know, we, we hear about leadership. And we know that, um, you know, leaders uh, bringing people together to solve problems is, is how change happens. And I, I think you just told the story right there, right? You, you didn't set out to be a leader. Um, and, and, and being a leader is often so much about, you know, what title you hold as opposed to what you do. And, and I think people are just so often, you know, the other uh, uh, men who are following your leadership, you know, they weren't going to be the ones to come in and get it started but they wanted someone uh, and they needed someone to inspire them to come on and get engaged and get involved and to be able to be a part of their children's lives. And, you know, I, I actually ended up doing, you're talking about reading uh, to kids. You know, I, I just did this uh, live from the library um, uh, and I think they put it up on Facebook where I was reading this book and they're showing it to, to kids. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I did it once. I, we'll see how well I did if they'll ask me to do it again. Probably not. But but uh, people can see you all the time, right? Reading the kids. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. So uh, every Friday, uh, because school is not in right now, every Friday we do a virtual uh, read a book day. We call it read a book day live. Where I come into my home, uh, as you see the backdrop behind me here. <laughs> I love it. I have, I have, so the two oldest daughters, uh, they do wardrobe, and uh, the other one deals with the camera. And then the three youngest babies, they sit here in front of me, and I read books. And then, of course, uh, you will see these different bears that we have. <laughs> Wait a minute. Who you got there? Wait a minute. Who you got there? What are their names? Okay. Well, this is Mrs. Piggy right here. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and also, some of these bears come from Great Wolf Lodge, right? So Great Wolf Lodge right. donated these teddy bears to us. And also, Bernie's Books donated books to us. Whereas when people tune into our show, we're able to bless families and children with free books and, and free teddy bears and try uh, to make it kind of um, exciting and interesting for the children. So when they tune in and now from starting our first episode, we are now on episode 16. And even on episode 16, we get like a couple thousand of views now. And I just feel so blessed because the books that we read is all based on social emotional learning. We read books to boost our children's self-esteem. So we want them to know no matter what someone says about you, if your nose is big, your ears is big, or how you may look, you always love yourself. You always treat yourself okay. It's okay to be upset. But everything about these books is something that teaches our children life lessons. So as they grow, they understand just a little bit more. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and, uh, and, and tell us about uh, where we can find that again. Where do we go to tune in? Oh, yes. So uh, you can tune in on our Facebook page at Mr. Dad's Father's Club. And you can also go to the website at Mr. Dad's Father's Club dot com. And on the events part, you'll be able to click for anything that we have coming up for upcoming events. And you'll be able to click on the link and it'll pull you right into the Facebook page for you to come and check out a few of our episodes. You sound to me like the black Mr. Rogers, you know, I, 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 <laughs> is that, I, I, I'm just saying. 
yeah. I, you know, that, 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 that's who you sound like to me. Well, well, I, well I'll say this. Um, I've heard that before. And I'll <laughs> say that um, I love it, right? Um, the, my ultimate goal is, is to let the imagination go wild, right? Yeah, um, e- even when I come in and we do our episodes, here and there I come in with my tennis shoes on, and I change into my dress shoes, and then I got my favorite song that I created, and it it, it go a little bit like this. My singing not all that good, but I give you a little bit. And, and give it to us. Like, um, the Mr. Dad Father's Club, be the birthday. Talking about the Mr. Dad Father's Club, <laughs> read a book day. What you got to say? So, <laughs> so you shut it down. Like, you just you just shut it down. I love it. We're gonna keep going, but you know you just you yeah. just shut it down. So yeah, so that's my um little theme songs or whatever. But um, it's just amazing. And I, again, I feel blessed to be able to change lives and to come into our families and children homes, especially throughout this pandemic where anxiety and depression and so much is happening right now. We gotta kind of find a way to take our children away and still let them know it's okay. And even let the families know that, right? And, yeah. and, and I'll add this last piece here. Even when I was reading books in schools, um, something that I really hope to see one day is eventually we can get not only into more CPS schools, but also mm-hmm. be able to actually give our fathers stipends and be able to pay them to also be involved. Whereas right. we're helping get fathers off of the streets and we're helping get fathers from doing things that they probably shouldn't be doing or whatever the case may be, but we're actually able to keep them involved by coming in, being involved in their children's lives, and, and also other children, reading books. And what I notice is that these men, they love their children. These children have saved some of these men's lives. My, mm. my children saved my life. So just to understand the impact and how it works together, I think if we can eventually one day pay our fathers to come into the schools, I think it'd be even greater. We'll, we'll, we'll be saving their life. We'll, we'll be saving the children's lives. And I think it just uh, all work out together, honestly. Well, you know, I, I, you, you, you can't be what you can't see. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that also leaders have to have a vision. And I think, it, I think you have a real vision um, for, for healing, uh, for activation, um, for community and for family. And, and, and I also, you know, want to, talk about the, how, how important this kind of social emotional learning is, particularly for uh, the young people who are, are in the neighborhoods in, in Englewood, uh, on the west side of Chicago, um, but not just there, right? It's the same, it's, it's hard out there uh, with the pandemic and even before the pandemic in rural communities and, and inner cities around the, uh, around the country. And, and, and so, you know, Let's talk about what went down um, just a few days ago, because uh, to me, you know, you, the, the leadership style that you have, the way you show up with heart, with vulnerability, um, you know, that showed up in a, in a, in a, in a very volatile, um, violent situation. Uh, so, so, so talk a little bit to me about that and about the situation you found yourself in, uh, where you found yourself kind of in between um, the, the police um, and, a, and a community where emotions were very high. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, well, uh, I don't know where, where do I start, right? But um, I'll say... Well, uh, what, yeah, tell me, so it's, I might, you know, look at one of the things that I know is that it was on a Sunday, and I know hearing you, Sunday is a day that you dedicate to your family. Um, so I, so, you know, I'm sure you were, you know, you kind of with your family doing your thing. And then, I, and then you found yourself, you know, in the middle of the street. So, I mean, even talk to me about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so absolutely. So, so Sundays is family time all the time. Every Sunday I try to make sure I pull that time away from for the family. And um, this particular Sunday I was at home about to watch Netflix with my son. We were looking for this uh, Spider-Man homecoming movie and uh, <laughs> we about to lay down and just chill. And yeah. then my home, alerts is going off for Facebook. So I go on my Facebook and it's a live stream on Facebook showing the police and the community and it looks very intense. I'm like, what is going on over there? I'm like, hold on, baby, this is down the street. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta go. So she's like, baby, where are you going? I'm like, babe, I gotta get down the street. I gotta get over here real quick because there's a situation going on with the police and the community. So I didn't know what I was walking into. I flew out of my house. I went down the street and um, 
and 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 once getting there on, on the scene, um, it was exactly what I saw on Facebook Live. It was very intense and very hostile, and you could just tell that um a lot was just happening out there. So the first thing I did once getting out there was just really paying attention to everything around me and trying mm -hmm. to be an open ear to just hear what was some of the things that was happening. So I talked to some of the, the community members and say, hey, what's going on? And somebody said, hey, this young man got shot by the police. And, um, and they talk about he got shot 15 times. And then I go and I talk to someone else and they say, hey, my cousin, he just got beat up by the police. And I'm just trying to get all of this stuff together and get the information in. And then from there, I went over to the community engagement part of the police department and said, hey, um, do you have a status on the young man that was shot? And they said, well, he's in stable condition right now. I said, well, what about the gentleman that was supposed to get beat up by the police? Is there any updates on him or what's happening with him right now? They said, well, we don't know what district he's at exactly, but we know that he did get arrested. So I say, okay, um, it, in my mind, the first thing I realized is that a lot of the community members were upset because of the information that they had heard. So right. the first thing I wanted to do was make sure that I was very clear with that and let the community know, like, hey, the young man was not shot 15 times. Uh, the young man actually is in stable condition right now, you guys. So even after telling the community that he's in stable condition, you heard pe people clapping and some people started praying. And, and, and you okay. could see the tone of the crowd starting to come down a little bit. The gentleman that was supposed to have got beat up by the police, um, I spoke with the commander when he came out. And the commander worked with me to help that family connect back with them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we started to see a little results. But even while trying to see those results there, um, it was still hard, right? Because right. I'm trying to mediate and trying to help de-escalate what's happening out there. But while trying to do that, the police are still kind of aggressive right now. They're in the right. community. They're not making it no better for me. I'm getting the community to calm down, but then you got some community members who are still upset, and they're and they're speaking and 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 they're emotional and they're talking about it. But the police didn't understand that all the way. So one officer he reached out past the line and grabbed the individual from the community in. And when he did that, all of the police came from behind him. And before you know it, the police was out into the community just chasing people. So now you got women and children and regular community members just out here running while the police was just kind of flushing them out and just running into the crowd. Yeah. So yeah. it made you know, it I'm, yeah. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second, just because I want to, I, I just want to put a fine point on something that I'm hearing here, which is important. And I just want to make sure I'm hearing it right. Yeah. I mean, one, you know, a lot of people when they would see what would happen on Facebook Live would just either watch it, would, would turn away, or would just watch it, or would go out to try to agitate. And so I think the fact that you went out to go and make a difference, and that was your instinct, I think is just, it's, it's commendable. And it, it's not a small thing. And, and I think it's something that really it inspires me. And so I, I wanted to just say that to you, uh, brother, uh, uh, because I, I just, no matter what happened, the fact that you went out there and went out there with the purpose of, of, of making a positive difference is, is really an important thing. I think the second thing is, is that to me, it sounds like you've been in there so much, in the community so much, you have relationships. You knew people to talk to about what they had heard. You knew who was doing community affairs at the police. You sounds like you had at least knew the commander. And so you were able to kind of mediate and kind of be in between these two, uh, the, uh, these two sides. Um, I, I don't want to say sides in that way, but these two different groups of folk um, in order to make sure that they were sharing information. And, and I, I just think that that's really important, right? You, you had those relationships, right? Yes, yes. And I think having those relationships are very important. But even like helping a community organize, right, because I had the opportunity to uh, go on my Facebook Live. I went on and went right back off. Um, I didn't show anything. I just went on there and said, hey, this is the situation that's happening out here. And, and with me doing that, other community or organizers came out to give me support. So okay. they, and when they showed up, it helped me so much. And it helped me also organize the community. Because when things like this is happening in our communities, you know, mm -hmm. communities don't always know how to organize and how to be protected in these situations. So when the organizers came out to help me out, it helped me a lot to the point we built the wall up. And after building the wall up, we put the community behind us. So then we- You mean like a wall of people? You mean you, uh, you, you yeah, kind of- 
we linked each other arms and built an entire wall together and said, look, this is our side, this is their side, and no one from the community is going to come past us. This, this, in my mind, this was a way to keep the community safe because if they're continuing to be spread it and on the front end, right in front of the police, you're going to continue to see things happen. So I say, you know what, let's find a way to protect the community. So let's put them behind us. And then we stand on the front line, we let the police stand on their side, and we make sure no one crosses that line. Now, while mm -hmm. doing that, I'm continuing to work with the commander so we can still get results to happen with it being over 100-something police over there on one block. So now we're trying to find a way, how can we get some of these police to leave? So now that we've got all these police running to Inglewood on this one block, now we have to figure out how do we get them to leave so we can kind of tone it down a little bit more for the community now. Yeah. So the commander, um, he helped me out a lot. He, he, he worked with me, and he uh, said, hey, Joe, I need your support now. He said, I need to get these officers out of here. Um, are you mm -hmm. able to open a pathway for me? So me and the other organizers, we opened it up. The community and everyone went onto the sidewalks, and the police were able to march directly down the street and get back to their cars safe and go back home to their families safe. And I always say, although they didn't treat us with the same respect when they came into the community, they came in running with their batons out. They had um, rifles strapped on them, but we made sure we organized and we did it the right way so they can still yeah. leave and be safe at the end of the day. And after those police left, right after they left, everyone outside almost went home. They started going right. back on their porches. They went into right. their home, or they just right. left. It, it right. just showed me that... <laughs> How how sometimes if the police are in our communities and they don't have the community engagement or relationships or they don't know what to do when moments like this is going on, it just showed me so much seeing that because it's like, hey, I'm trying to see who was the problem here, kind of man. The police left, the whole community dispersed and they left. I'm trying to see, you know, so um, to see that happen, it just told me that we didn't need that many police over there and, yeah. and if the police were going to be over there they should have been a little bit more respectful that a community was hurting, a community needed more information, a community has to go through this, and we go through mm -hmm. it on an everyday basis. So you have to come with empathy and, and willing to be open to the situations when you're coming into these communities. And uh, um, it just made me understand a lot more, though. Yeah, I love that. I love the word you use, empathy. Um, and Joseph, you know, I, I think that, you know, the other thing I hear is, you know, one of the things that we're, trying to, one of the things that really is important to us at the Obama Foundation is we, we want to build a network of community leaders so that they can work and learn and connect with each other. And I think that, you know, sometimes this work um, uh, and being out there and being a leader in that way, uh, it can be lonely. Um, and, and, and also, you know, there, there can just be a lot put on you. And so I think that, you know, the fact that you have that network and, and that network really believes in each other because when you, when you said what was going on, you know, as you said, they came and they came with the same spirit that you came out there with. Absolutely. A spirit of, to help, a spirit to be positive. And I think that, you know, more than anything, I, I believe you gave the, the citizens the opportunity to um, kind of control their own community and their own neighborhood. And, and that's, you know, that's all my neighbors want. That's all your neighbors want. That's, that's all people want is, is to be able to um, control what goes on um, in and around their home um, and, uh, and, and not feel vulnerable um, and feel, and, and it's, a, it's such a crazy time right now. There's so much that feels out of control. I, I just really respect uh, you for uh, the way you gave people that ability. And I guess the last thing I want to say before I let you go is, you know, or ask you about is, you know, I, 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 you know, I know you uh, have such a heart for young people um, and all this energy and everything that went, went down, um, you turned it into another thing that was really positive, right? Didn't you have like a, a youth march, a youth engagement moment? Oh, yes, yes. We had a Youth Matters March. Uh, we yeah. are going through a pandemic right now, but I can promise you, uh, we did social distance. We had <laughs> a whole lot of children outside. Um, yeah. And again, I just felt blessed to be able to be a part of it. Um, you had so many dance teams. Uh, one thing I noticed is that our children love to dance. So we had uh, about 20 plus dance teams marching down the street. Every stoplight, they got a chance to put on this amazing show. And at the end, we made sure we gave them laptops, 
uh, uh, shoes, uh, back to school supplies. We went out there and we hustled to get all these different donations. And we just wanted to make sure that we sent the children back to school uh, the right way and just kind of provide mm-hmm. them with all the resources and things uh, that they needed. And uh, it was an amazing day. We had Sasha Gohard as one of our guest judges. Uh, so I think, man, it was you, super you cool. You know, I don't know who Sasha Gohard is. <laughs> so, don't make me I look bad. I just kind of learned myself a little bit. But, <laughs> don't but, make me know, look bad, man. I, I guess one piece I like to add before I leave is um, yeah. we are working on our community garden. So this community okay. garden is in Roseland. Um, I, I'm thinking about it every day. I'll be going out there today with the family to kind of surprise my children with it because they haven't seen it yet. But what I really expect for this to be is a safe place for families and for children mm. to come out and fathers can go on a bookshelf and read books to the children. You'll be able to go over into the mini theater where um, I can come out and read books live or someone can come out and do a performance for the children. So, And then you're also going to learn about healthy eating and growing vegetables. So um, this garden is going to be a different type of garden because I really want the imagination to run wild. I'm even going to have a youth fountain but children to come up and make a wish sometimes. So wow. I, I really want this uh, garden to be really, really nice. So I just had to put that out there about the garden. And I'm glad also, you did. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you did. Because, it, it, you know, to me, it sounds like, a, a, you know, a version of what we're creating um, uh, on the south side on, with the Obama Presidential Center. You know, it's going to have a library. It'll have a garden. You know, Mrs. Obama uh, has her garden where she yeah. teaches about healthy eating. Um, it'll be a safe space. Um, it'll be have a theater and auditorium. And so, I, I, you know, I think this, this sounds like we're going to have a great partnership. Uh, it's going to take us a couple of years to get ours built. Uh, so until the Obama Presidential Center comes, I say go out to Roseland uh, yeah. and go out to the garden then. And then, you know, when, when we get here, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just work together to make sure that we're, we're together um, just creating the kind of community that people need. I, I, you know, thank you so much, Joseph, for, um, for being the kind of uh, leader that you are, for being the kind of man and brother that you are. Um, you know, you, you, you're vulnerable. Um, you, you're not afraid to show emotion. Um, but, you, you know, but, but it all comes towards and, and out of, uh, if I can use this word, out of love. Love for your family, love for your people love for your community and, and, and you inspire me, man. And, and, and so I, I, I just can't thank you enough for doing this. Um, and I hope, you know, people will really get a chance to, to follow you, see what's happening. We're going to come back uh, and, and we're going to have more leaders like you that I hope to get a chance to talk to. So thank you for being a violence interrupter. Thank you for being the brother that you are. And thank you for inspiring me. And thank you so much. Okay. Talk to you soon, brother. I'll see you.